Welcome to my message today as I talk about Grow in Christ. This is the final message in a series I'm doing right now called the Seven Churches of Revelation. And today we're going to do kind of an overview, wrap-up uh, type of sermon as we talk about growing Christ. Because what the seven churches of Revelation are all about is spiritual growth. That's right, spiritual growth. The consistent theme of all of these letters, written not only to those churches, but to all churches and to all Christians, is to grow. And what Jesus did in every single letter was he identified at least one area of spiritual growth and how they need to grow in that area. And this is all based on the basic truth that there's no such thing as a perfect church, nor is there a such a thing as a perfect Christian. Every church needs to grow spiritually. Every church needs to grow spiritually. Every Christian, okay, because when I say church, I'm not talking about a building or an institution. The church is the people, okay? And, uh, and so there's no such thing as a perfect church because there's no such thing as a perfect Christian, and all of us need to grow. And so today I'm excited about uh, sharing this message uh, with you, and, and also today we're going to have communion. And so the Bible says before we have communion that we should examine ourselves. And uh, so at the end of the sermon, uh, we're going to have communion, and I hope that you'll take time uh, to look closely at your walk uh, with the Lord. Now, just in case uh, some of you today are here for the first time, and I hope that's true, I hope that we have regular new people attending this service, and if you're new, welcome, welcome to this uh, sermon series. And, and by way of review, the seven churches of Revelation are, are found in the book of Revelation. That's the last book of the Bible. And, and the word revelation means the unveiling. That's what revelation means, unveiling. And in chapters 1 through 3, Jesus unveils seven letters that he wrote to seven literal churches. I can't emphasize enough. These were real churches, okay? Uh, they don't exist today as far as operating uh, churches, but the remains of these churches, even today, as we've been showing you uh, week by week in this series, uh, the cities remain, uh, the church, uh, churches remain. Uh, these were not like figurative uh, examples. These were real churches during that time. And so in Revelation 1-9, uh, Jesus came to John. John was on the Isle of Patmos. He was being persecuted. Uh, he, he put it this way. He says, uh, I was being persecuted uh, for, the, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.9. I'm being persecuted for the uh, word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he's been taken out of his church. He was the pastor at the church at Ephesus, which we'll talk about today. And they literally kind of imprisoned him on this remote island off of the coast of what is now modern-day uh, Turkey. And, and so today we're going to be looking at this, and, and I want to read our key verse for the series, uh, which is Revelation 1.11. Revelation 1.11 says, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and the last. That's Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, I'm the first, the last. He says to John, John, what you see, I want you to write it. And then I want you to send it to these uh, seven churches. So he had a big responsibility to dictate it down and to deliver it to the churches. And those churches are located uh, in, the Bible calls it Asia, uh, because that's what it was called during that time, actually Asia Minor. Uh, but today it's modern day Turkey. And here are the cities, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Well, with that said, let's talk about growing Christ. Let's talk about growing Christ. So what I want to do is I want to review the letters and tell you the particular area or areas where Jesus told them they needed to grow. And then I want us to apply that to our lives. Because, you know, the bottom line is probably today uh, we're going to find an area too where we would raise our hands as well and say, I'm guilty of that also. Uh, I, this is an area where I need to, to grow, all right? And what's exciting about this is the, the purpose of our church is to lead people, listen, in a growing relationship with Jesus. 
And, and so this hits right on target of why we are even here today, all right, uh, to lead us in a growing relationship with Jesus. So if you sense the Holy Spirit convicting you, that I call it ouch, you know, that little, that little ouch or that big ouch you might get when the word is being preached, that's the Holy Spirit nudging you and convicting you of, of, your, of your sin uh, so that you would repent from it and turn to the Lord. So please do that, okay? Well, today we're going to read the final verse of the seven letters, and here it is, Revelation 3.22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, Jesus says, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's talk about how, how to grow in Christ. But before we do that, I want to highlight this commandment that we just read. Because Jesus commanded every church in every letter to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, did you hear what I just said? Okay, Here, Here's the bottom line of what I just said. The only commandment, all right? So there's some statements that are in multiple looks, uh, books, like I know your works. Uh, that's in those seven letters ten times, okay? But not in every single letter, okay? It's repeated a lot but it's not in every single letter, all right? This is the only statement that's in every single letter, all right? Jesus said to them, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Revelation 2.7, Revelation 2.11, Revelation 2.17, Revelation 2.29, Revelation 3.6, Revelation 3.13, and then also, I just read that, Revelation 3.22. What's the bottom line? They were told there would be great benefits. Jesus would tell them, okay, hear what the Spirit's saying, and if you obey, there's going to be lots of great benefits for listening. But also, let's be real now, Jesus also said there's going to be severe consequences for not listening, all right? So it's a serious thing when Jesus convicts you of sin, that you, that you deal with it properly. And, 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 and repent, that means turn. You're going, you're going the wrong way, do a U-turn and turn back the right way uh, to Jesus. The application is clear. Here it is. We are to keep growing in Christ. That is the bottom line. Keep growing. Don't, don't ever stop growing. I, you know, some of you have heard me say before, the biggest room in the world is the room for self-improvement. That's right. The biggest room in the world is the room for self-improvement. We can all do better. And, and until the day we die, uh, there's going to be areas we need to grow spiritually. Okay? There's always going to be room for growth. And that's what he's saying to them. And also, in doing so, in, in, in growing in Christ, uh, he says, you're going to experience my presence and my power in your life. He gives the promise, you, you obey me and keep growing, you're going to know my presence, you're going to know my power, and listen to this, this is awesome, and my reward in eternity. So on, on earth, you're going to have my presence and my power, and then when you die and you get to heaven, there's going to be great reward. Wow, I'm excited. I'm excited about doing this. Now, we're not going to be able to spend long. Okay, this is review, okay? And if you missed any of these sermons, uh, you can look at, listen to the full-length sermon uh, on our website, okay? Uh, or our YouTube channel, our Facebook, our church app. It, it's out there for you, okay? And I hope you'll, you'll listen, all right? But let's t talk, you know, three or four minutes about each church for evaluation of ourselves, examine ourselves, so number one, the first way to grow in Christ, grow in love. Grow in love. So this was about the Ephesus church, and I call this the busy church, the busy church. You see, they were doing a lot of stuff for God, good stuff, positive stuff. He, he doesn't ever say, stop doing the stuff you're doing, okay? He doesn't say that because they, they were doing the right thing, okay? But the problem was, uh, they weren't doing it from the same position they needed to be. And that was from, from the heart, okay, from the heart. And, and, and it's important to understand that this church is like around 30 years old. 
so what this means is they're starting to get like into the second generation uh, church. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the principle here is as your faith grows uh, old, don't let your love grow cold. This, this is a dangerous thing for Steve Reynolds, okay? You know, I grew up in the church. I was saved as a child. I've been in church all these many, many years. And, uh, and for some of you that are like me, one of the dangers for us is, you know, we can just serve the Lord, you know, and we should serve the Lord. Uh, but we can, listen, over time, not have the heart uh, that we need to have uh, for doing that, for the Lord, Okay. And uh, so he says in Revelation 2, 4, Nevertheless, I have, got, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. He says, okay, you did this, you did this, you did this. Again, never says stop doing those things. But he says, okay, nevertheless, even though you're doing all these things, I have something against you, and that is you've left your first love. And that can have multiple meanings, okay? But the idea to me is it's that tenderness, that that excitement, that motivation that you serve, but you serve from the heart. It's not just out of duty. It's not just out of routine. It's not just out of habit that you serve from the heart. And here is what I recommend we all do. Always prioritize intimacy over activity. Always prioritize intimacy over activity. So this is important, okay, because we can be so active, and it's okay to be active, all right, but keep that intimacy with the Lord. And the story I want to share with you is Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, where Jesus is in a situation where he teaches us an important lesson. It says, now it happened as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So here's Jesus, and he's spending time. I call these friends, all right? I mean, yes, he discipled them and worked with them, but, but uh, you know, I like to always remember people. Jesus was a single man, and, you know, he didn't isolate himself. He built relationships, all right? Everybody needs community, everybody. And so the Bible, I believe it's three times, records Jesus. I, I call it just hanging out with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. These were two sisters and a brother. And so Jesus goes to their house, to their home. And I just want to highlight Martha welcomed him into her house. That's an important statement. We should all welcome Jesus into our homes. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So today we want to highlight Martha is the worker and Mary is the worshiper. Martha is the worker and Mary is the worshiper. And it says, but Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me uh, to serve alone? Therefore, tell her, tell her to help me, all right? So here's the deal. There's nothing wrong with what Martha is doing, all right? It isn't an issue of her activity. It's an issue of the priority at the time. Jesus is in the house, okay? And, and, and it's most important to take time to build intimacy with the Lord, okay? And Martha is serving, but Mary is worshiping. And Jesus responded to Martha, who made this demand for her sister to be told to get up and come in the kitchen and help her. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. But well, one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part that part which will never be taken away from her. One thing is needed. What's the one thing? Taking time to worship the Lord. Always take time. Daily private worship. Spending time. Having what we call a quiet time. Just, just Even just a few minutes can make a drastic uh, positive commitment in your life. Uh, what, a, what a change just to spend time reading the Bible. Spend time praying to God. Private, and then public worship. Every single week, being as faithful as possible to attend a, a gathering like you're doing uh, today, all right? Do you need to grow in love? Maybe you're doing the right thing. Keep doing it, okay? But listen, keep that intimacy with Jesus. Make sure that heart is tender 
towards the Lord. Don't just get caught up in a routine and a habit and, 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 and duty, okay? Remember who you're serving, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, grow in suffering. This is the Smyrna church, the Smyrna church. I call them the persecuted church. Uh, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. This church faced great persecution, great persecution. Uh, that persecution included uh, poverty, Many of them lost their jobs because of their uh, commitment to Christ and not bending the knee to Caesar and so calling Caesar Lord. They, some of them lost their job. Uh, slander. Uh, they were mocked and made fun of uh, because of their commitment to Christ. Some of them went to prison. Some of them went to prison. And listen, some of them even died as martyrs for Jesus. Listen, this is nothing new to the church. The, the history of the church uh, has, has a long uh, history of, of, of people having to pay a price to serve the Lord. And even you and I, we, we, if we stand for Christ in this age uh, we live in, even here in this wonderful country we live in, uh, the Bible says if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. And so you've got to realize, you know, as you stand for the Lord, not everybody's going to like that. And you might not always win the popularity awards, uh, but the bottom line is it's the right thing to do. And the message is be faithful when tested. He says, okay, you're going to be tested. Uh, and always remember, here's what we always, always got to remember. Faith begins where human understanding ends. Faith begins where human understanding ends. You know, during times of persecution and, and pain and, and suffering, it's easy to like think, wow, you know, is, is this what God's doing or whatever? And begin to, to have doubts. We'll talk about doubt more in just a bit. Uh, you know, but we have to realize what the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. It says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now, listen, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Why? Why do we get tried in our faith? It says that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, we go through various trials to determine the genuineness of your faith. And I always like to say, you know, the truth is Steve Reynolds doesn't really know how much faith he has, all right? I might say I got great faith, but listen, when you go through a test, when I go through a test, you really find out, even if you have faith, okay, because it's easy to have faith and trust God when, when you like what's going on, when it makes sense to you, but faith begins where human understanding ends. And I'm sure these believers in Smyrna, you know, as they were facing uh, poverty, slander, prison, and death, we're wondering, wow, you know, you know, is this God? I mean, can I trust God? And, and, and their faith was being tested. Hey, let me ask you a question today. Is your faith being tested? Is it genuine? Is it real? Think about that, okay? And, and maybe what you need to do today is you need to grow in uh, suffering. Because I, I like to put it this way. You can go through it. You don't have any choice, okay? You're going to go in this broken world we're going to suffer, okay? It's no doubt about it, all right? So you can just kind of grin and bear it, okay, best you can, or you can grow through it. You can, you can get bitter, you can get better, all right? Grow in suffering. Number three, grow in truth. Grow in truth. So this is the Pergamos church, and I call this the compromising church. The compromising church. And what Jesus confronted them about was truth and that they had allowed false doctrine to come into their church. It says, but I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, 
who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit sexual immorality. And then number two, thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So I don't have time to unpack these doctrines, okay? But bottom line is they were false doctrines. Uh, in fact, Jesus says uh, concerning the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. I mean, the, these were horrible, horrible doctrines. And, uh, and what he says to them is, you know, I hate this. I hate this false doctrine. And what he's telling them to do is, hey, grow in truth. Make sure your doctrine, that, that's what you believe. That's your statement of faith. That, that's what you believe. Make sure uh, it is true to the word of God. And where do we get that from? We get that from what? The Bible, right? This is where our statement of faith comes from. This is where our, our doctrine comes from. It comes from the Holy Word of God. Because the Bible is inspired by God and informs you of truth. The Bible, listen, the Bible informs you uh, of truth. This is where you get truth. You know, in a world we live in today where we're all asking, you know, you know what's true? I mean, there's so, so many positions and so many things, you know, today because of social media, because of the internet, you know, we are exposed to more teachings of all kinds than ever in our lives, okay? And it can get confusing sometimes. And what we have to do is we have to say, okay, you know, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about this? Because Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth, what? Your word is truth. Where do we find truth? The Word of God. And listen, realize the enemy is going to try to do this. What he, what he did to this church at Pergamos, basically he, he got them to fall into some false doctrine. And really what that is, it's evidence of doubt. Doubt. And so I like to put it this way. Don't put a question mark where God puts a period. Don't put a question mark where God puts a period. You go all the way back to the beginning. The first man, the first woman, Adam and Eve. And what does the devil do? Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, here it is, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Question mark. I mean, it was clear what God had said. God said, I'm putting you in this garden. You can partake of everything in this garden except this one tree. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, the day you partake of that, you're going to die. And, and Satan came along and said, hey, are you sure about that? Don't put a question mark where God puts a period. Believe the word of God. And Titus 2, 1 says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for a sound doctrine. We got to make sure our doctrine is sound according to the word of God. And so maybe they, you need to grow in truth. You need to spend more time in the word of God. Spend more time knowing what you believe and why you believe it. Number four, grow in purity. Grow in purity. This is the church at Thyatira. Thyatira. And I call this the immoral church. The immoral church. Why? Because Revelation 2.21 says, and I gave her, that was a, a false a prophetess, her name was Jezebel. I gave Jezebel time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. So this woman was teaching immorality, okay? And basically, you got to understand, it wasn't just like, you know, a form of, you know, sex or whatever. It was also a form of worship, okay? Because they would actually go to these temples and, and as part of their worship uh, towards their false gods, uh, they would have sex with prostitutes and such. So yes, it's bad enough just, just to have sex outside of marriage or whatever, but this was even a degree more than that in that it was also an act of worship. And Jesus confronts Jezebel, confronts this church, and says, you're committing sexual immorality, and he gave her time to repent. But they did not repent, right? So what do we learn here? Obey God's standard of sexuality and hold fast to purity. So God has a standard, okay? And it's revealed to us in the book of beginnings, right? It's always important, you know, uh, it's called the law of first reference. You want to understand something in the Bible, as you study it, go back and see where it's first mentioned because that plants a seed 
for that particular truth, all right? And God laid out sexuality in Genesis 2, uh, verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become uh, one flesh. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, Now Adam knew Eve his wife. She conceived and bore Cain and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. And so, you know, there was a time that I didn't even have to make such a statement as I'm getting ready to make. But today, it's just crazy what's going on here, okay? So God's word is clear. Sex is between a man and a woman who are a husband and a wife. That's it, okay? Sex is between a man and a woman, not a man and a man, not a woman and a woman, who are husband and wife. Anything outside of that falls into the biblical category of sexual immorality. And, and, and they're committing this, this sin, and, and Jesus confronts them and gives them time to repent. And it's basically like in John chapter 8, verse 11, where the woman, remember that story, was caught in adultery. And Jesus said to her, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. And maybe today, an area where you need to grow, let, let's be real, this world is so tempting and there's so much availability to, uh, to sexuality, you know, on our phones, on our computers, uh, you know, everywhere we go. There's basically no, I mean, honestly, the truth is the average person on the street these days doesn't even know God has a standard, okay? I mean, that's how bad it's gotten, so to speak. And maybe you've fallen into that trap of sexual immorality. Hey, grow. Go and sin no more. Repent. Number five, grow in life. Grow in life. This is the Sardis church. The Sardis church. They were the dying church. The dying church. And you might remember if you heard that sermon, we talked about how this has an application for individuals and uh, for the church in general. Because what we have to understand is, you know, if we don't uh, grow in life uh, as a church, we could go out, so to speak. We could die. Churches die. And I shared with you a, a, a very depressing statistic um, that, that 45 churches uh, closed. This is a survey that was done uh, not too long ago. And they, they do this survey on it's LifeWay. Maybe you've heard of LifeWay. LifeWay Research. And this is something they do. They don't do it every year, but they do it you know, consistently. They've been around a long time. And their last one showed 4,500 churches closed. And on top of that, 3,000 did start. Praise God for church planting and starting churches. But that's a net loss of 1,500. And here's the deal. This is the first time in the history of their research that there's been a net loss. That is scary. That's sad. That's terrible. And, and listen, this was a dying church, okay? And, and listen, you can be a dying person in the sense that you can just not have the life, the energy that, that Jesus has for us. And he said to them, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I've not found your works perfect before God. What, what is he saying? He's saying, wake up. They, they were a sleepy church. Have you gone to sleep? And, and what was interesting about them is they had an awesome reputation, but their reputation didn't match their reality. They were, they were kind of still coasting on past success, if you will, because this church was an amazing church. I mean, they had, they had done a lot of great stuff, and they had a great, it says, name. It says, Jesus says, I know you got a great name, but listen, at this stage in your church, your, your name's not matching the reality of the situation. He says, wake up. And, and basically, you must be honestly aware of what I call the gaps between your reputation and your reality. We have to be careful with gaps because ga gaps are where uh, deadness sets in, okay? And, uh, you know, the gap of reputation versus reality there's a gap of, of what we say and what we really do. Uh, there, there's a gap uh, when it comes to values versus actions. These are all important things. And so we have to constantly be growing in life or we will die, okay? We will be that. We can't, we can't live on past uh, successes 
We have to deal with present reality. And every single day as a church, we need to wake up and we need to do whatever we can to make sure capital is filled with life, okay? Filled with life. And the same is true as individuals, okay? Because if we don't do that, you know, we don't, if we don't invest in our marriages, they're going to die. If we don't invest in our children, uh, those relationships are going to die. If we don't invest in our career and the job God's called us to, we're going to die. I mean, in, in every single area of life, grow in life. Number six, grow in evangelism. Grow in evangelism. Here Jesus says, I know your works. Now, I referred to that earlier because that is an often repeated statement ten times. Ten times. Jesus is the one who knows our work. I think in the first sermon I talked about undercover boss. I don't know if you ever saw that show or not. I like that show. I, th- I don't think it's. I, don't th- I think it's still on for to watch, but I don't think they're making new ones. Okay, where where the boss goes undercover and the ch- chairman of the board, and the CEO, you know, hide themselves and disguise themselves and go in and work with the employees. And it's really an interesting show. Okay, I, the reason I like it is good for it's a leadership. It teaches a lot of good leadership lessons. Jesus knows our works. He, he, he's, he's among us because the church, we, he's the head. He, he's the boss of the church, okay? And he says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have, you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Let me read it again. I know your works. He says, see, see, I have, I have before you an open door. And no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, but you keep my word, you've kept my word, you've not denied my name. So open door. It's, it's mentioned multiple times in the Bible. And what does it refer to? Open doors are opportunities to evangelize. Every time we see this phrase, a door is opened, it's always in context of you got an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. Evangelize, maybe it's a term you've never heard before. It means to proclaim or to announce the good news that Jesus died for our sin, was buried, and rose from the grave. Uh, For example, 2 Corinthians 2.12 says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. It's when, when the Lord opens up a door for you to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that said, you know, our next teaching series is going to, is going to be called Anxious for Nothing. And, and I'm, I am so excited about this series, okay? Because we are living today uh, in what's called the, uh, the, the Anxious Generation. There's a book, okay, I'm reading right now. It's a long book, it's almost 300 pages, but it's full of great research uh, on why are people so anxious these days, okay? And and so God has put on my heart uh, to do a teaching series, and really I call it a spiritual growth campaign uh, on anxiety, anxiety. And and I'm just telling you, we have an open door, okay? Because, listen, the Bible gives the answer for anxiety, okay? Okay? And we need to let people know about this uh, opportunity uh, they have to get some help, to find some calmness in their lives through the Word of God. That's an open door. Who can you invite? Hey, online, you can invite people from anywhere in the world, right? So do it. And then lastly, grow in passion. This is the Laodicean church. This is the lukewarm church. So then, because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I mean, the Bible teaches us the normal Christian life is a burning heart on fire for God. We we need to burn for the Lord. We We need to have a heart for the Lord. Romans 12, 11 says, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Well, right now we're going to come to the Lord with communion, okay? And as we do that, has God spoken to you today about your love for Him? Has He spoken to you about suffering and and growing in your suffering? Has He spoken to you about the truth and and sound doctrine? Has He spoken to you about purity and, 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 and living according to God's standard in that area? Has He spoken to you about life and, and how you can 
put more life into your life and more life into your church? Has he spoken to you about evangelism? Has he spoken to you about an open door you might have? Has he spoken to you about passion? If he has, it's an area where you need to repent today or grow. You need to do that, okay? You need to do that. So I want to pray. Dear God, thank you for these seven letters. Lord, you've taught me so much uh, in this series. So many things I, I never understood or never knew, and you've convicted me in some areas where I need to grow. And God, we thank you for what you've done today. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, thank you for the sacrifice he made for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. As we do this, I want to read from Revelation chapter 1. This is a passage I didn't refer to in the series. But you go back to chapter 1, and here's what it says. And from Jesus Christ, so it's saying these letters are from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I want to highlight that statement, washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus came and he provided cleansing. He provided salvation uh, for us. And he made a way for us to go to heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he made a way for us to be forgiven for our sins. And so today, we don't have to walk away from here full of guilt or shame. There's, listen, none of us are perfect, okay? Just, just, just come before God and, and come clean with God and, 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 and determine you're going to live for Him, okay? That's, that's what He expects of all of us, okay? So today, as we do this, I want to read the first communion story in Matthew chapter 26. And here the Bible says, And they were eating, and Jesus took the bread. And so the bread represents the body of Jesus, that body that was given for us, both physically and spiritually. Uh, he gave us uh, his body. And so we take the bread today, and it says he took it and blessed it. Lord, we bless this bread, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. He broke it, he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Praise God. And then, verse 27, then he took the cup. The cup represents the blood of Jesus, and he gave thanks. Lord, we give thanks for the cup, and most importantly, what it represents, the blood of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. In his name we pray, amen. He gave it to them, and Jesus said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Praise God. Lord, thank you that you've called us to grow. And Lord, help us to maximize our growth and be everything we can be for you. In Jesus' name, amen.